All right, welcome back. Today I'm going to tell you about a paper that we just had accepted earlier this year where we use machine learning to accelerate geometry optimization in molecular simulation. If, you, if you've done molecular simulation before, you know this is a really common task where you, you have an initial guess for your geometry and you calculate the forces using something like density functional theory and then you move the atoms to make the forces go to zero which minimizes the energy. And this is done hundreds and thousands of times all the time and basically every one of them starts from scratch. And the basic idea in here is if we have in say one dimension, let's say we have a potential energy surface like this and this is our initial starting point, what we do is, is use the forces that are the gradient, right, that tells us what direction to go that's downhill in energy and then you, you take a bunch of iterative steps like this until you get to a minimum in energy. And most optimization algorithms uh, use not only the first derivative but also the second derivative, the, the Hessian. But we don't have a way of getting the Hessian out of DFT. We only get the gradients and so a lot of algorithms iteratively improve the Hessian uh, as, the, as the steps go. And the critical point that I want to make is that all of these algorithms start from scratch almost every time. And so what we are um, going to show you in this paper is how we use machine learning to build a surrogate model in the DFT. And that allows us to run the surrogate model for many steps much faster as long as we know it's accurate. That's the trick. If it's not accurate, it will go off into some space that is not interesting. And so we have a way of estimating and, and that will give us uh, a way to uh, leverage machine learning in this in this work. All right, so um, this is work done by Yilin Yang and my group and Omar Jimenez Negron, who is an undergraduate from uh, University of Puerto Rico in Mayaguez and did an REU um, research experience with with us. Okay, so um, basically the idea is that we have a neural network that is the machine learning uh, model that we use and it's uh, based on the single neural network um, paper that I uh, talked about a couple days ago and we have some fingerprints that go represent atomic environments they go through the neural network and we have multiple outputs that give us the atomic energy and then finally we combine that to get the total energy and we can take the forces uh, by just back propagation of the derivatives through this and we can also use automatic differentiation to get uh, the Hessian if it's desired but we typically don't need that. What we mostly want is this model to be accurate and fast so that we can use it instead of, of DFT for the, uh, for the calculations. Now the way we estimate the uncertainty is we don't use a single neural network. We use an ensemble of networks. Maybe 10, uh, 10 is usually a good number. And we train uh, each of those 10 networks on the data and we initialize them differently uh, so that we get 10 different models. And in theory, if we have enough data, then there'll be low variance in the prediction, and then we, re we consider that to be reliable. And if the variance of the 10 models is bigger than, say, the variance we know in the training error, that's an indication that the models do not agree and that we need to go back to DFT to get more training data. Okay, so um, how does this uh, work in practice? So here, here is a simple example in one dimension. We take uh, the Leonard-Jones potential and this, this blue line here that's shown here, and we have these red data points where we can uh, fit something to it. And I show two different versions here. One is uh, on the right, neural networks, and one on the left, the Gaussian process. So many people like Gaussian process regression because it has a built-in way of predicting the uncertainty and what you can see is where we constrain the, the model to fit the data, the uncertainty is very low, but as we get far away from the data, you start to see variance in the predictions and that is an indication that this machine learning model is uncertain and unreliable in, in these regions. And we get the same kind of behavior with neural networks in the region where it's constrained. The model fits very well and the variance of the predictions is low and as we get far uh, from it, it gets um, larger. And so we would know out here that our model is not reliable. So this is sim uh, a simple example in one dimension. Um, what we typically have to deal with is, is many dimensions um, because we have more atoms than, than a simple dimer. 
but the, the idea is the same. And so the, the general workflow that we have is we have an unknown configuration that we want to relax. We would start by doing some vast calculations, use that data to train an, an ensemble of networks, and if the ensemble is accurate, meaning the variance uh, of predictions is low, we can use that with the geometry optimizer to find those. And if it's not, we round this cycle. Now, there are a couple of ways to implement this idea. One is that you, you simply start with the geometry and iteratively train um, the, the network, and then you reuse the network for a new geometry. Or you can do all of these things in parallel. So you can have, say, 20 geometries you want to optimize and at each step retrain the neural network ensemble. In that way, you're kind of building up a, a pseudo semi uh, machine learned potential to accelerate the geometry. But let's talk um, just a little bit now about how well this works. So, so we call this iterative approach and others call it uh, this too, this kind of active learning that as the neural network is accurate enough, we use that for the optimization, and when it's not, we add data and retrain and, and repeat. And so the first thing we'll look at is how does this, does this perform in terms of DFT calls? And I show here a variety of different metal surfaces, FCC 100, 111, 211, 643, and an adsorbate on a surface. So we see hardly any benefit on these simple basically flat surfaces. These are so simple and they take so few steps there isn't really an opportunity to learn much and there's not a big benefit. But as the surfaces get more and more complex, less symmetric and require more steps, we start to see a big benefit. So by this uh, 643 surface that is like a kinked surface, we see a reduction of about a factor of two. And when we start putting adsorbates, even on a simple surface, we see a reduction of about a factor of four. That means uh, if this calculation previously took four days, now it would only take one day. And so you, you could get a lot more results um, in that same amount of time. So that's uh, the first example that I want to show you. So the orange bars are the normal vast quasi Newton algorithm. It's one of the best uh, that, that we've used. And then the blue bars show the number of DFT calls that are required with um, just the simple active learning uh, process where we relax each configuration independently. All right, let's look at what happens when we can share information among the configurations, either by doing them in parallel or by utilizing prior data. So this figure shows for 13 different um, configurations of acrolein on a silver palladium alloy. What happens um, without any of this, it takes about 193 steps for the geometry optimization to happen. If we use a Gaussian process regressor, uh, we get a reduction to about 43 steps across all of the configurations. Now, this Gaussian process is one we implemented from the literature, and it's not, uh, I, I won't claim that it is an optimized um, algorithm in terms of like what the kernel is and, and other things with hyperparameter tuning, etc. But even with a simple implementation, we get a huge reduction in the number of steps. Things get quite a bit better when we go to the single neural network architecture, where the blue line here shows we go from 193 to about 18 steps, um, which is again, a, a very large reduction. And if we run things in parallel so that we're doing multiple um, training and geometry optimizations at a time, we go from 193 down to about 11 uh, DFT steps. And, and the best case scenario is if you already have a bunch of trajectories that you've run, you can pre-train your machine learning algorithm, and we call that the warm-up here, and you see we get down to almost seven steps. And in the limit of a fully trained machine learning potential, you could get down to zero steps, but typically uh, a fully trained machine learning potential requires you know thousands or tens of thousands of DFT calculations. To get to and and that's usually more than uh, you're interested in for an application like this so the last thing I'll talk about is you know once you have uh, pre-trained or, or done this if you have a reasonably trained neural network it is possible to use it in an offline way uh, to pre-relax 
So if we do that, um, or if our initial DFT calculation has you know typical uh, errors that look like this, then we can use the uh, neural network that we've trained to pre-relax and get down to um, forces that are practically as good as what you would get by relaxing with DFT along the way. And using our neural network is so much cheaper than doing DFT that it is probably a good idea uh, to be thinking about how to do this. All right, we looked at a couple of other more complicated systems. So again, thinking about starting from the simplest high symmetry uh, surfaces like 111 to um, more complicated ones. Here we break symmetry by making an alloy in a couple of the layers. Here we look at nanoparticles with adsorbates. And here we have uh, acrolein with an adsorbate. And what you can see again, the, the orange bars are almost always higher. So this, this breaks symmetry a little bit, but we still see a factor of two. With the nanoparticle and CO, we see a, a very large, almost factor of 10. Uh, similarly, for, for this uh, floppy adsorbate, we see a very large reduction in the number of DFT calls. Um, this doesn't work just for DFT calculations and geometry optimizations. We can also look at nudged elastic band, which is a different kind of constrained optimization. So with the nudged elastic band, you have a chain of images and you run an optimization on that chain where you constrain um, the forces by projecting the ones out parallel to the band. And what, what you can see here for two different examples, one is this heptamer um, rearrangement of platinum and the other one is uh, acetylene hydrogenation over here. So this one is a very large calculation we ran with EMT. This is a DFT calculation. And the best, uh, the best way to see the difference is up here. With the heptamer, um, we required 596 EMT calls. And with our uh, active learning approach, we only required nine. And then for uh, acetylene, it took 1,100 calls uh, to VASP. And with our ensemble approach, we could get the same uh, barrier for practical purposes with only uh, 30 calls. So this is um, overall, I think, a very promising approach to speeding up all of these geometry optimization ideas. And, and the gist of it is that we have the surrogate model that learns uh, or is trained to reproduce the energetics and forces of all of these geometries. And so we don't have to start from scratch every time. That's really the reason why we're able to speed this up uh, so dramatically, um, is that we have a, a cheap, accurate surrogate model that we uh, built by DFT. So that's uh, that kind of brings us to, to the end of this one. There's a couple of other you know interesting details about training time and, and things like that. Um, but we're pretty excited about what this uh, allows us to do in terms of leveraging computing resources and, and our time. And next time I'll show you how we use this to um, model segregation and absorption in, in the dilute limit. So that's it for today. Uh, thanks for